Okay, so we're going to talk about DNA and chromosomes today. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, which is a polymer of, a nu of nucleotides. Remember that nucleotides have a three-part structure. So this is a review from, our, from a previous lecture. Um, all nucleotides have a phosphate group, a five-carbon sugar, or a pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Okay. Uh, DNA nucleotides have, for their sugar, they have deoxyribose. Okay, I just want to remind you about the numbering. So we number the carbons in the ring. Um, the first carbon to the right of the oxygen in the ring is carbon one. Okay, and when we are using doing nucleotides in the, the five carbon sugar in that, we use the one and then the prime. We add that little prime. Okay, so this is carbon one prime. Um, carbon one prime always has the nitrogenous base attached to it. This is carbon two prime, and this is the one where there's a difference between um, o, uh, ribose and deoxyribose. If it's ribose, then it's going to have an OH group, and if it's just uh, if it's deoxyribose, it'll just have that hydrogen. The three prime has an OH group hanging down. The four prime um, carbon is the last carbon in the ring, and then the five prime carbon has the phosphate group. Okay, there are four DNA nucleotides, and they are all named for the base that they have, and that's because, remember, the phosphate group and the sugar are the same, and only the base is different. Okay, so this particular base is called adenine, okay, and then that also gives this nucleotide its name. We call this adenine, okay. Um, because the phosphate and the sugar stay the same um, for all of the nucleotides, we end up just referring to this as a base and just calling it adenine or A. Okay. Here's guanine and here's the base um, that gives it its name. So this is guanine. Phosphate and sugar are the same. Here's cytosine and that's the base part that gives it its name. And then finally there's thymine, same thing. Um, so I don't expect you guys to um, be able to draw these um, or be able to even tell me the specific differences between adenine and guanine or cytosine and thymine, uh, but I would like you to know the differences um, between two of uh, the two types of uh, nucleotides. And that has to do with the base. Okay, so these bases, notice, have a five carbon ring attached to a six or sorry, a five-sided ring attached to a six-sided ring. They both have that. Um, their rings are the same, even though the things that are attached to them are different. Okay. And that's what I want you to notice about these. We call these the purines. The purines have a double ring. Okay. Um, and adenine and guanine are the ones with the double ring. Okay. Cytosine and thymine have a single ring for their base. And again, they have um, the same single ring, um, but they have different things attached to it. Okay. We call the ones uh, that have a single ring, we call them pyrimidines. So these have a single ring. Okay. And cytosine and thymine are the single ring or pyrimidine nucleotides. Okay, so um, my little shortcut for remembering, um, you know, is a purine the double ring or the single ring? And what about pyrimidines is uh, just thinking about this. So purine is a shorter word than pyrimidine, okay? And yet the purine bases are the bigger ones. They're the ones with the double ring, okay? So shorter word, bigger base. Longer word, smaller base. These are the ones with the single. You might come up with something else to remember those. That's just the way I always remembered it. Um, and then you just have to straight up remember that adenine and guanine are the purines that have a double ring, and cytosine and uh, thiamine are the pyrimidines that have a single ring. Okay, and then these are all attached to each other um, via dehydration synthesis, and that's what this is showing here. It should look familiar. Um, we're going to add in here uh, the numbering on all of the carbons. So this is one carbon, or one prime carbon, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime very well that's okay I remember each corner is a carbon right and then this one also has a one prime a two prime a three prime a four prime and a five prime and we'll do this one too one prime two prime 
three prime, four prime, and five prime. Okay, so every nucleotide has um, all of these, and you could think of it as having a, a three prime end and a five prime end. Okay, so the every nucleotide has that, and also the whole nucleic acid strand has that. Okay. Why is that even important to know? Um, well, it's because of how they're connected together. Okay, so when a new nucleotide is being added to a growing strand, say you're building a DNA, um, the OH group on the three prime carbon and the hydrogen off of the phosphate group are pulled off and they go and make water, right? And then a new bond is made between this carbon and this oxygen. And that's the same as this bond here. Okay, and then it links together the nucleotides. That's called a phosphodiester bond. Um, and the enzyme that does this is called DNA polymerase. Okay, so that's the enzyme that does that. The enzyme, DNA polymerase can only um, take in um, a nucleotide and add to its three prime end, add the, um, the phosphate group from the five prime of the next nucleotide. So it always has to grow adding onto the three prime end. Okay, so that says that OH group on carbon three prime bonds to the phosphate group on the five prime carbon of the next nucleotide. They always add together that way. Okay, um, and then once you have added them together, you get a super long strand, right? This is just showing a very short strand, a uh, nucleic acid strand, but they obviously get much longer than this. Okay, so I want to point out a couple things on this slide. Uh, the first is that whole three prime end and five prime end. So we just talked about that, that every nucleotide has one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime carbons, okay? When you are linking them together, um, the whole nucleic acid has both a three prime end and a five prime end. Why are we just looking at that? Because those are the ones that are involved in forming that phosphodiester bond, okay? Um, so understanding this whole three prime and five prime end um, is sometimes a little confusing. So the way I think about it is this. So if this molecule were laid down flat and either you were tiny enough or it was big enough that you could walk on it like a sidewalk, um, say you got onto the sidewalk here, you would get on at the three prime end or the first carbon that your feet would touch would be the three prime carbon. Okay, then you'd walk, 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 go across the four prime carbon on the five prime carbon and then go to the three prime carbon. Okay, and then do the same thing walk along that part of the molecule and then when you got to the end the last carbon your feet would touch would be the five prime carbon and so that's called the five prime end okay so this is the three prime end and that's the five prime end okay um, so that's one thing to notice about this another thing to notice um, is that the phosphate sugar backbone repeats so here's the phosphate group and here's the sugar and here's the phosphate group and here's a sugar and a phosphate group and a sugar and a phosphate group and a sugar, right? Every nucleotide has that same phosphate group and sugar and they're attached to each other. And then the sugars are attached to the base, right? So it's just kind of a shorthand way to say it. Um, so this here, the phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar thing is called the backbone. Um, and that stays the same all the way down the DNA molecule. And the only thing that's different is which base is here, okay? So this is adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, okay? Um, and another way to write that would just be to write it out sideways, A, C, T, G, okay? That's shorthand. Um, and that, reading this, you should remember that what we're really talking about are nucleotides attached to each other, right? So, you know, here's one nucleotide, second nucleotide, third nucleotide all attached to each other, okay? And the phosphate sugar backbone repeats and the only thing that stays the same, uh, or the only one that changes is the base. Okay, uh, a DNA molecule is not single-stranded, however, it's double-stranded. That means it has two nucleic acid strands linked together. Um, they both have a phosphate sugar backbone, right? So phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. Um, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, and the backbone 
faces out, right? So this is the phosphate sugar backbone on one strand, and this is the phosphate sugar backbone on the other strand. Okay, they face outward towards where water is and that kind of thing, and the bases face inward. So here are the bases. And they also bond to each other. And so the whole, the strands are held together by these hydrogen bonds between the bases. That's what those dotted lines are showing, are the hydrogen bonds between the bases. Okay. Uh, these hydrogen bonds form between particular bases and work to hold the whole DNA molecule together. Um, remember when we first started talking about hydrogen bonds, I said that they were weak, but that they were really important because they hold together some important molecules. So we've already talked about how they can be important to hold together proteins. And here's another example of how they're holding together DNA. Okay, so without the hydrogen bonds, the DNA would fall apart. Okay. Um, so these um, hydrogen bonds form between the bases uh, according to base pair rules. Or you could also, these are also called like complementary base pair rules or comp they're called complementary bases. All those things are referring to the same thing. Um, and the rule is that A and T will always form hydrogen bonds together and G and C will also only form hydrogen bonds together. Okay, and that's what's shown here. So every time you have an A, you have a T on the other side. Every time you have a C, you have a G on the other side, and here's a T and an A and a G and a C. Okay. Um, this is also showing that A and T make two uh, hydrogen bonds, and C and G make three, and that's just because of those uh, particular opportunities for, to form hydrogen bonds on those molecules. Um, because of the base pair rules um, and these hydrogen bonds, we say that the strands are complementary. So if you know the sequence of one side, you can then predict the sequence of the other side, right? So if one side has this particular sequence or order of bases, then the other side will have the complementary bases, right? So remember, A and T go together and G and C go together. So I'm just reading down. Every time I see an A, I put in a T. Every time I read a C, I put in a G. If I read a G, I put in a C. If I put in, if I read an A, I put in a T. Okay. And that gives you the other side of the DNA molecule. Okay. And if you want to be um, add a little more detail, um, then you could draw in the hydrogen bonds, right? So there's two hydrogen bonds between A and T. There's three between C and G. I'm not going to do this for all of us. I think you get the idea. Um, so this is just showing the bases that are going towards the center. Remember, there's the phosphate and the sugar attached to the base. And the phosphate and the sugar. And the phosphate and the sugar. And so on, all the way down the line of both sides. They also have the phosphate sugar backbone. Okay, and then finally, uh, the two strands are anti-parallel, okay? So we have the phosphate sugar backbone on the outside and the base is facing inward, and then each also has its, you know, the direction that it's going, okay? Each has a three prime end down here, and this one is up here, okay? Anti-parallel means they're going in opposite directions, kind of like two sides of a freeway, okay? So their three prime ends are opposite each other, and then they go to the other end, with their five prime end. Okay. So they're going in opposite directions from each other. So if one is going three prime to five prime, then the other one must be going five prime to three prime. Okay. That is anti-parallel. Okay, so now we can add to this um, the, the five prime and three prime ends. So if one strand is going five prime to three prime, uh, with this sequence of bases, then the other strand has to be going three prime to five prime, right? So this would be T, this is the same sequence of bases as on the previous slide. We're just adding in that we now are showing the, um, the ends, right? So five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime. And then finally, the whole DNA molecule forms a double helix. So these are this is called a base pair. Oops, I didn't quite do that. Um, this include the phosphate groups is called a base pair. Okay. Um, a and T are base pairs. And DNA, a DNA molecule that forms a chromosome, 
uh, can have millions of base pairs in it, so they're really long, okay? And then they form um, a double helix. Um, in other words, they are wrapped up together, okay? Um, they're kind of twisted. So one way you could think of this um, is as a ladder, okay? With this is one side of the ladder, and this is the other side of the ladder, and then the bases form the rungs. That's the part that you put your feet on, okay? So there's a ladder, okay? And I think it's gonna get rid of this for you. Come on. Come on. Okay, um, and then this, this is the same thing, right? So here are the sides of the ladder, and these are the rungs. So if you just take a ladder and twist it, then you get the double helix. Okay. And then this is showing a, a space filling model. These outside parts are the, um, or the phosphate sugar backbone form the outside parts and then the bases form the rungs. Okay. We have a model of this that you can look at in the classroom as well. All right. DNA molecules uh, are then organized into what are called chromosomes. Okay. So essentially, a DNA molecule and a chromosome are essentially the same thing, um, but you could have a DNA molecule that's not a chromosome. So a chromosome has proteins associated with it. One of the types of proteins that it has associated with it are called histone proteins. Okay, um, So they're basically used to package up the DNA. Yeah, like I said, DNA is really, really big um, and, in a, and has to fit inside, an, inside a cell and inside a nucleus. Um, and there can be many uh, chromosomes or DNA molecules inside of a nucleus, so they have to be organized. And that's what this process is showing. So a chromosome um, is the DNA double helix uh, that is then wound around these histone proteins. Okay, the histone proteins act as a spool and the DNA is like thread. So, um, you know, if you take thread and wind it around a spool, you can keep it from getting tangled. But if you just put a pile of thread someplace, it's gonna get all tangled. Right, and the same would be true of the DNA. So the histone proteins help keep it organized and untangled um, and allow the cell to move it around during um, cell division. So it's wrapped around the histone proteins and then that is wound up even more and then those are wound up even more. Okay, so there's multiple levels of packaging that then allow this chromosome to be squeezed down into what's called a condensed chromosome or completely folded. And we see these right before a cell divides, so we'll come back and see chromosomes that look like this. If a cell um, is just doing its thing and it has proteins being made that it's not going to be fully condensed. So how is genetic information stored by DNA? Uh, it is stored in the sequence or the order, you can think of it either way, of the bases, right? So the order of the A's and T's and C's and G's, how they appear. That's how the genetic information is stored. Um, and that's because the order of bases um, determines the order of amino acids in a protein. And that's, of course, the primary structure, right? The order of the amino acids is also called the primary structure. And that's um, what gene expression is all about, and that will be in our next lecture, talking about how that happens. Chromosomes are organized into areas of genes, um, which are coding regions, meaning that they have the information to make a protein, and also intergenic regions, which are non-coding regions. So this is showing a chromosome, and if you pull it out and look at it, some areas are going to be genes, going to carry information to make proteins, and other areas won't. They're non-coding regions. So um, the genes are the basic unit of genetic information, and the genes that you have determine your inherited characteristics. The specific segment of DNA at a particular place on a chromosome, um, which is called the loci, is, where, is what a gene is. Okay? and it codes for a particular protein, okay? So on a chromosome, it's in a particular spot, it contains a particular sequence of uh, bases, of DNA bases that code for um, a particular sequence of amino acids in the protein. And then the intergenic regions um, can either be regulatory sequences, so these are areas of uh, the chromosome that turn on other genes or turn off other genes, and then some of it is, um, doesn't appear to be doing anything. It might be considered to be junk, or we just don't understand it yet. 
So interestingly, all organisms store their genetic information in the sequence of DNA bases, so in the a order of A's and T's and C's and G's. Right? So we all, all organisms on all organisms use these four DNA bases, and yet we don't all look the same. Right? So you might wonder if we all use the same information to store our genes to store our genetic information and also we also all use the same 20 amino acids how is it um, that different species don't look alike and how is it that individuals of the same species um, look different from each other okay and this is all about genetic variation um, and genetic variation just refers to the differences in base sequence between um, different species or between individuals okay. uh, so Different species have less overlap on um, their DNA sequences um, than similar same species do. Okay? But even between individuals of the same species, there's some overlap where they have the same sequences in the same place, and there's some places that don't overlap. Okay? If, they're, if we all had uh, the exact same uh, genes, with the exact same sequence of bases, then we would all look the same. Um, we can utilize this information of comparing the DNA sequences between uh, different species um, to figure out um, how closely related different species are. Okay. So here's an example, um, looking at a gene uh, that's from a mouse and a gene that's from a fruit fly. Okay. These are two organisms that are frequently used um, in studies. They're model organisms. They actually are more similar to humans in their genes than you might think. Um, but so this is just looking at one gene, so one part of one chromosome um, that both mice and flies have. And then it's doing the comparison of the DNA sequence or the order of the bases, right? And so it's looking down at each place. Do they have the same or do they have different? Okay? Every part that is green is where they have when they're where they are the same. Okay? We call these conserved sequences. And every place that is white is where it's different, right? Like here, mice have a G and fruit flies have a C. Okay, here, mice have a C and fruit flies have a G. Okay, because this makes them makes it code for proteins, it can end up making slightly different proteins or entirely different proteins. Right? Um, interestingly, um, you know, mice and fruit flies are very different from each other. However, they still at this gene, for this gene, they're 76.66% similar. So gene, uh, organisms are often more similar to each other genetically than we might imagine. Um, we can also um, look at humans and compare them to other primates. So humans are primates, as are chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Um, and we can compare um, our DNA sequences um, to that of these other organisms to try to sort out humans, um, like how we're related to these other primates and what our evolutionary history is. Okay? So our, when you look at this, what it's showing is the areas of, that are blue are the same and the areas that are white are different. Okay? So you can see that our um, pattern is most similar to the chimpanzees. Okay? And this is called a phylogeny. It's basically the same information um, that is presented slightly differently, and we'll be looking at these again when we um, come around to looking at evolution. Um, but what this is showing is because humans and chimpanzees are, have the same, what's called a node, that means they evolved from a common ancestor, and that common ancestor had this in common. Okay. Um, there are differences, right? Even though there's a lot of commonalities, there are, a lot of, there are differences too. Uh, that's why we're different from um, chimpanzees, right? Um, but when you compare humans to gorillas or humans to orangutans, you see less overlap, and that puts them more distantly related. Okay? Um, so we can use this kind of information, the sequencing of uh, chromosomes, figuring out what the order of bases is in it, and then comparing between different species, and also between individuals of the same species. So all organisms have DNA, and DNA um, is stored as like a chromosome inside of cells, so therefore all cells have chromosomes. Um, prokaryotic cells, remember those are the single-celled organisms like bacteria and um, archaea, have a single circular chromosome. Okay? Uh, it's still made out of the same nucleotides, um, and it's uh, 
the information is still stored in the sequence of bases, but the structure is slightly different. So it's one and it's circular. And remember, it's not in the nucleus. Uh, eukaryotic cells are a little different. They still have the same DNA, right? Same four bases and all that. Um, but we have uh, linear chromosomes and multiple linear chromosomes, so not just one. Okay? And then they're all squeezed into the nucleus. Okay? And this is just showing that packaging. It has to be packaged in order to fit into the nucleus. All right. So we all have uh, DNA. We all have chromosomes. We all have genes on our chromosomes. Um, but the number of genes, which is shown here in the, the black, and the uh, number of, sorry, the number of chromosomes is shown in the black, and the number of genes is shown here, um, differs according to the species. Okay, so different species um, have, oops, ignore that for a second. <laughs> different species have a characteristic number of chromosomes, right? So E. coli is a prokaryote; it has one chromosome, and on that chromosome, it has a little bit over 4,000 genes. Fruit flies have eight chromosomes, chickens have 78, humans have 46, and a grape plant has 38. Okay, so you can see um, that there's not a correlation between number of chromosomes and intelligence or complexity, because definitely humans are a lot smarter than chickens, and I know that because I have chickens and they're not very smart. Um, uh, but there's also not a correlation between number of genes and complexity, right? Because grape plants have more genes than do humans. So it was actually surprising when people were first able to kind of figure out how many genes um, different organisms had. There was an assumption that people would have the most, but they don't. Um, but one thing is true is that uh, the number of chromosomes is the same in all cells of the organism. Okay, so all cells in the fruit fly have eight chromosomes and also all the genes are present in each one of the cells so there's also 14,889 genes in each cell okay same for humans every cell um, except for eggs and sperm which we'll talk about later have 46 chromosomes and there are the 2,000 or 22,333 okay but multicellular organisms have cell types that are different right um, so humans you know we have um, nervous system cells, brain cells, and nerve cells. We have blood system cells, like red blood cells and white blood, blood cells and that kind of thing. Eh. Um, and muscle cells. And the, the cells express different genes and do different jobs and look different. And that's all from cell differentiation, okay? Um, which is the process where a cell goes from being um, able to be anything, basically, to um, to being very specialized. So cell differentiation is also cell specialization. Um, but we maintain the same number of chromosomes and the same number of genes. Okay? So um, a muscle cell uh, will only have muscle genes being expressed, but it will still have all those other genes there that are present. They're just shut down. They're not being expressed. Okay? So and during the process of cell differentiation, which happens in very early embryonic development, um, cells become destined to become different types and they have genes that are turned on and some genes that are turned off. 